there we go. And yes, my, my research area is in complex systems modeling using statistical computing. I've been lately working on social network analysis from the statistical point of view, and in particular with what's called exponential random graph models. I'll be talking a little bit about that today. And also uh, with phylogenetics, which might sound like very different things, and they are, but I actually found common ground from my statistical point of view, so that's why I'm, I'm mixing both of them. Um, yeah, so I, and I and I I wanted to start this group because I think it's a good idea. People of, of that likes network networking, of course, and yeah, and and, and that's on my side. So um, uh, who's next, Jack? Hi, everybody. I'm Jacqueline. Jack, please call me Jack. Um, I am a third year PhD student at the College of Nursing. Um, I met George um, at CANA, the CANA meetings hosted by USC, and I'm really glad that he started these meetings here at the U for us. Um, I, just FYI, George, I know that uh, a lot of the, um, the colleagues from the College of Nursing uh, wanted to be here, but um, a lot of them are at SBM this week, so oh, that's probably okay. why they're not logging in. But I'm um, very happy that we've got this going. Thank you so much. Nice to meet everybody. Yeah. Oh, we can't, we can't hear you. We, we can't hear you. Switching microphones. Let's try that one. Is that working? Okay. That's okay. One, yeah. It's one of these, uh, always these complexities these days when I reboot my computer, what's going to happen with my headset? Uh, I'm Jonathan Butner, also go by John. It's interchangeable to me, it doesn't matter. I am the department chair of psychology. I'm also a professor in the psychology department and I self-describe as a dynamical systems theorist. So I think about and work in the world of complexity. My training is actually as what might be called as a quantitative psychologist. So I am like what a biostatistician would be, but I'm much more on, much like George, I'm on the development of various methodologies and use. So a lot of a, sort of applied use and development. Um, and so I do a lot, I'm very much, uh, I am, I would describe myself as network adjacent and complexity compl intensive, meaning I'm a, heavily in complexity and live in and dance into the world of networks here and there as it relates to dyna dynamic systems. Okay, my name is Jawa Guo. I am I'm also from nursing. You can, you can look at the owl there. Uh, I think they can see me from many different ways. Right. <laughs> and where I'm at. Oh, um, I, uh, I'm teaching nursing informatics. And I've done a little bit of social network analysis. That's why I've been interested in this project and uh, this topic. Oh. That's why I'm here. And my own research focus on uh, using electronic medical record and then to do some analysis. That's, that's, that's really cool. I'm sure that there's people on the call who will be interested in your, in your research. Uh, right, Eamon and MJ? Yeah, sure. Uh, and then I'll hand over to MJ. Uh, my name is Eamon. I work at the Torch Lab with MJPU, and I also do a little work at the TBI Concussion Center with Elizabeth Wild and David Tate. Sorry if I'm feeding back. Um, I think it's the it's, it's the owl. <laughs> yeah. So um, my I'm, my background is that I'm a biophysicist, um, and then I kind of moved into clinical research, cancer diagnostics, and therapeutics, and I've done a fair bit of work on high throughput screening, metabolomics, sequencing, proteins, things like that. And uh, now I'm. Uh, working on a variety of problems in the electronic health record, but also in primary data collection and experimental design uh, with a particular emphasis as MJ has on um, veterans who have had experiences of traumatic brain injury and their sequelae and comorbidities. Thank you, MJ. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Mary Jo slash MJ Pugh. I am a, uh, actually, I'm a nurse and a developmental psychologist, and I've been interested in disease networks for since probably about 2005. 
And as Eamon said, we're focusing a lot on TBI kind of diseases that are somewhat networked with TBI and um, looking at phenotypes of different kinds of TBI and different outcomes of TBI and all things injury related and uh, sequela of not just TBI, but extremity injuries and those kind of things in, in veterans and military service members after military types of exposures. That's me. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Luis? Hi, everyone. I'm Luis. Um, I'm actually a post-bac fellow at NIH in the Human Genome Research Institute. Um, but I'm, I'm working remotely, like, from Salt Lake City. So I'm in Salt Lake City, but um, every, my whole team is in DC. Um, and I work in a lab where we study the, like, social networks of families with um, children with rare genetic disorders, but also the networks of, of families affected by um, chronic illnesses like diabetes. Um, and I am starting a PhD in sociology in the fall. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think that's, uh, that's everyone for the moment. Uh, thank you again for joining remotely or in person. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, meeting each other more frequently in person as well. So by the way, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that you already cleared up, but we are recording the meeting. Oh, sorry, one second. There's no water coming out of here. <laughs> and it's full. Cool. Mm. Okay. So yeah, and, and I guess, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the whole idea about the, the group is that just to have a, a space that we can talk about networks, about complex systems in general. I, I happen to be, I think, in both worlds. I, 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 I do a lot of social network analysis, but also complex systems modeling, which, uh, which you can have in like all the fields, biology, psychology, and uh, mathematics, and whatnot. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just a, a general, very biased overview about like network science and social network analysis. Of, and just to give you a, an idea of what methods and things are out there that we can be using for analyzing complex networks in general. Okay. And as I said in the chat, so you can download the slides from my website. I, I put the, the link there. And uh, yeah, so it has a, a ton of references. And for those of you who were not before, uh, I apologize in advance if you see a, a word in Spanish, because I, this is a version of a Spanish talk I gave a couple months ago. <laughs> so, and I think that, let me see how can make this thing work. Okay. So the way I organize this is, uh, I'm going to give a, a brief discussion about like modeling networks. Then some taxonomy that I've been thinking about uh, because I've been, I work a few years as methodologist, as a consultant for statistical analysis networks, and that I've seen some common patterns, and I think that we need to have some sort of a structure that we can use to better organize and let's say uh, uh, direct the way in which people analyze networks. Okay, and finally, some a, a bit more of uh, some thoughts about more on modeling complexity. So the typical question I, I faced in the past is I have, for example, I have data A, B, C with some hypotheses. And the thing is that people ask me, okay, what method should I use to address this question, right? And when people approach me to ask this question, it's not because they have like a, a regular data structure. So they usually they have, again, a network or some data that has some funky uh, 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 way to be described. For example, I don't know, you have a, multiple repeated measures of uh, families or, or whatnot, and data that cannot be directly analyzed, for example, like uh, with a regular logistic or GLM uh, method, okay? So the main thing again is, what method should we be using for to address this sort of questions? Okay. For modeling networks, uh, so before uh, a little bit of uh, context background, so today in a very not comprehensive survey again, so the classical statistical analysis assumes that observations are independently and identically 
distributed to each other, right? So, and again, so I'm, I'm giving this talk for a very biased version as a statistician also. So that's why I talk about this kind of stuff. In general, that's kind of the data that the, the things that people uh, teach us in grad school, in high school, and whatnot. So if all, all data is independent, again, you can just treat everyone as is there if they are, there's no spillover effects and all that kind of stuff, right? But uh, social, social people, genes, and other sorts of entities are not independent by definition, and that uh, gives us a, a problem, right? So if you assume independence under these circumstances, uh, this can actually lead to trouble. And trouble can be as little as having some bias in your estimate or up to what I think it's could be more common having uh, incorrect inferences because when you are assuming that things are independent, you're assuming things about the way that the errors are distributed. And from up there, we, besides the fact that estimates can be biased, then the standard errors are biased, so everything goes uh, downwards. And as I just said, uh, so even though there's uh, most of the time when people teach statistics, they teach tell you about that independently distributed identity data. Uh, the thing is that nowadays there are some programs that have been emerging and trying uh, and some training programs are on the rise. So, for example, in Northeastern University, they have the, the PhD program in uh, network science. I think Northwestern also have something related like that. And there are a few other places that have a PhD or graduate program levels on, on complex systems and networks, but it's not it's not something that is uh, very common and uh, training at, at, at schools is not uh, is not widely available so for example at back at usc i don't know how, what's the case here at the u but when i was at usc there were I, as far as i, I said no there were only two classes only about networks like in general <laughs> maybe three so there was one in math one in uh, uh, the school of forensic medicine sorry uh, the department of forensic medicine by professor valente and one on communications, but then other than that, there wasn't much resources to like uh, uh, grab on. In my case, I was interested in, in a family model that's called exponential random graph models. And actually, I saw uh, there was no class whatsoever that treated the, the theme in an advanced fashion. No statistics class that was discussing that. There's, there's a lot of applications, but I actually had to like uh, teach, teach myself about ergons to work on that. And that's really common across across the world, I would say, there are a few other places in which you have this sort of stuff. Again, I'm not sure that you, maybe uh, Jonathan may, may know more about it, but uh, uh, side note, that's also why I'm thinking about, and I think I, I, I've mentioned this to Eamon in the past, that I would like to, I'm, I'm trying to prepare some curriculum to have a class on complex systems and statistical computing right, uh, oriented to social networks and things like that here at the U. Okay, so Nonetheless, the thing is that nowadays we do have more, more data, right? Uh, we, we have more computational power, and because of that, some of these uh, ideas of independence and identi identical distributions, we can actually tell them a way to like actually tackle the more complex problems. And if there are many communities nowadays that are, um, for example, in network science and social network analysis that are accelerating the, the science. And but what, what I mean with that is that we do have, for example, in the social network world, world the community that is, again, around ergons, which is one of my specialties, is it's quite big. You have many experts that are like doing some incredible work. And we have, in the last 10 to 20 years, we have had so many advances in the area that it's, it's amazing. Things that we, we weren't able to like, think about in the past, uh, and because of computation is also advancing so fast, we have more, way more possibilities now about working with data that we didn't have in the past. So given all of this information that I'm, that I'm giving you, what, I, what I've been thinking of is that we actually need, and we, we could actually build like a more systematic view about how can we model networks and complex systems. And this is just an idea. So uh, again, this is pretty much very rough work in progress I've been, I've been thinking about in the last year or two. and. But in a very selfish way, if I've been thinking about this in order for me to uh, have an easier job helping people, right? Because when someone, if someone comes to me, ideally I will have come some kind of like a form. So somebody will go ahead and uh, fill the form, uh, put the checks, whatever you want to describe your data. And then based on that, I can tell you, oh, actually, you have to use this type of model. That's the ideal world. And that's what I'm trying to build. So 
the way that I think about this is that we have, let's say, like three dimensions in general. So first of all, is the data itself, right? So we have the structure, which is the network, and there you go. Actually, that uh, there's a Spanish word, as I mentioned. <laughs> uh, that's red means network. That's the word for network in Spanish. Sorry, <laughs> to ch change that. And networks can can be uh, all to have like dimensions themselves. It can be uni, uh, uni multi level. Um, it can be directed, undirected. It can be egocentric graphs, meaning that this is like a survey data in which you actually ask individuals, okay, how does your network look like? Uh, and it could be endogenous, meaning that, for example, the network is a dyna dynamic entity that uh, in which its actors actually design the structure, or it could be given, for example, uh, like like you will have in the case of what can I think of uh, like countries. If we think about countries, the way that they are connected by borders, it's a given graph. So that's not changing unless you ask Russia, but that's another thing. Uh, so there's, depending on all of this information, uh, you, you have different types of analysis that you can, methods that you can apply to this. And if you're thinking about social networks, we are also interested about behavior, right? And here of human behavior. So, and it could be, the data could be binary, it could be uh, continuous, it could be all sorts of information, and it could be also endogenous or exogenous, the way that you treat the data. Regarding time, uh, it used to be the case that we have like static graphs. We have a survey of a graph, only one network or one observation of a, any type of graph that you're working with. But nowadays, actually, we do have some more dynamics. You can you can see a graph throughout time. It could be uh, uh, longitudinal. It could be like a sequence of observations that you observe in a graph. So that changes, right? And it could be continuous, discrete, uh, sensor, unsensor, uh, or it could be static, as I, said, as I just mentioned. And finally, the, the, the third thing that sets the, the type of analysis that you can run is the setup, okay? And what do I mean with that? Well, um, first of all, the assumptions. What are you assuming about the graph? Are you assuming that the network is static? For example, it could be the case that you're looking at uh, a network in a, in a classroom of friend, friendship network, and you, are, you may assume that from one year to another, the graph is not going to change, so it's static. And if, it, if that's the case, then you, you can do some type of analysis, and if that's not the case, then you have to do some other sorts of analysis. Um, and finally, uh, the, the goal itself. So, what are you trying to do? So, if it's about doing the statistical inference, are you trying to, uh, again, so do some uh, causal analysis or what? Or do you just care about predicting? Are you, do you want to predict the graph? So, that's a, so those are different questions. And depending on all of these things, uh, the way that they combine, they give our, uh, they give. They give you, they, they tell you exactly what type of analysis can you do with this, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is that actually, I'm going to classify this in essentially two bits, uh, taking model the structure and the key. Okay, so uh, this is our, our goals. The two key dimensions, so we, we, we saw this three uh, bits before, right? But the, the, the ultimately, I think that what characterizes the type of analysis that we can do is uh, the, the structure and behavior itself when we're thinking about social networks. It could be that, for example, we just care about structure. We only, we just want to, we have a network, uh, we want to analyze the way that it looks like, and that's all that, that we care about. We, we don't care about, for example, if the individual smokes or doesn't smoke, if he buys it or doesn't buy any whatnot. Uh, if there's a vision of our behavior, we just want to see this structure. That's what we care about. And that's what sociologists, for example, uh, think about most of the, uh, very much of the time. Or it could be on the other side that we, we think about behavior. So it could be, okay, we, we observe a network of countries that they are connected through borders, and we want to see the way that um, a policy towards tobacco diffuses or if, and some, some, some sort of practice diffuses. In that case, the network is given. We don't care about the structure. We just take as a given and want to analyze the behavior given a network. Or it could be that we, we care about both. So we say, okay, what happens if we have COVID? We have to see that people uh, acquire the disease. And at the same time, if my friend gets the disease, I'm actually going to stop seeing that person. So the network changes. So you may care about the both things, the co-evolution of network and behavior. And that's another type of analysis. Okay? Again, this is all like a very general way of thinking about this. Uh, I'm still working on this. And if you have ideas, I'm, I'm happy to do it. So let's start by the structure. And again, the water is like, I, I, I barely get some, like, uh, you want to take 
Yeah, yeah maybe. I think that's a, that's that's a smart thing to do. Open the bottle. <laughs> that's a great idea. That's better. Yeah. So, in the case of network structure, if you're thinking about structure, what type of type of method can we use? Well, in the case of non-parametric methods, meaning that we are not making any distribution or assumption about the data, we have for a start a network bootstrap. Which is used to compute standard errors at the graph, uh, graph level complex. So, for example, you you see the you observe some degree sequence or average degree distribution or whatnot. You can use network bootstrap to get a standard error, like a, a, a standard standard error about the confidence interval for that statistic. Uh, and that's not that much because it's bootstrap, right? Or also, you can think about the network rewarding algorithms, which uh, physicists are very familiarized with. For example. Uh, you are looking at the network of, say, uh, words. So you, you see the way that words are connected to each other. But what you do is that you take the words and then, for example, compute some statistics about the count triangles, count the way that they are like interconnected, and to, to get some standard errors, to do some inference on that to see if some, some structure is prevalent, is non random. What you do is that you do a rewind. So essentially, you reconnect the, the, the graph, take the, the endpoints of an edge and like of, a, of, of edges and move them around, fixing the sequence, fixing the redistribution, or some other thing, which in social network is very, uh, it's known as cock test, for example, for those of you who are familiarized. Uh, cock test means, I think it's conditional uniform graph or conditional uniform sample test, in which you fix some, some feature of the graph and then you sample from it. This is again for uh, detection, uh, condition on some observables. And then also, there's also quite what's called quadratic assignment procedure, uh, which is essentially uh, some other form of permutation test in which you, for example, you want to compare two networks. So, what you do is that you take a graph and you essentially shuffle the labels around, move, move the labels around, and then compare graphs by doing that. And in the case of parametric models, of course, you have exponential number of graph models, which is what I've been talking all over the place since I got here, uh, including all of its favorites, like turgons, which are uh, temporal exponential random graph models. Then you have Bayesian exponential random graph models. Then you have uh, little ergons, which is what I did for my dissertation, ergometers, and uh, I don't know, all sorts of ergons that are out there. But, uh, but that's in the case if you have a static or a, or a dynamic graph that in which you observe like, uh, longitudinally, you, you observe like cut off the uh, Cuts of the graph throughout time. But if it happens that, for example, you have information about uh, communication, which is, yeah, if this individual email is another individual, then email is over two, and you see like a sequence with a timestamp sequence of connections, then you're thinking about uh, relational event models, REMs, and dynamic actor network models, dynamics, uh, which are ex essentially exactly for that. So to, uh, it's a parametric model used to model sequences. Of observations of connections throughout time, and there are some references uh, that you can you can take this data from. If you care about behavior and not about structure, meaning that okay, so we have a structure that are with the individuals or entities are connected, but we actually uh, take the network the connections are as given. Then, in the case of non-parametric, well, the, the most basic way uh, to do analysis is. A simple permutation test, right? So you should just move around the observations, fix in the way that they are connected, and see if uh, the connections are meaningful to, for some viable outcome. And there are others for sure, but the ones that I could talk about, uh, in the case of parametric, you have spatial autocorrelation. Uh, I'm sure more than one has ever heard about Lorenz I, in which you have, for example, uh, you are looking. You have the jungle, uh, and you have uh, the, 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 the presence of absence of some plant or whatnot. And, and you want to see the way that the presence of absence is out of correlated somehow spatially. Well, you can use Moran's eye. But the th nice thing about Moran's eye is that you can also map that into a network and use it for connections. We have used that in social networks as well. Then you have uh, something that is more fancy, which is the equivalent to uh, OLS or GLM. But when you have connected data, which are special auto regression models, in that case, what you have is that in regular GLMs, in regular OLS, you assume that errors are independently uh, distributed, right? But in, in the case of special autocorrelated models, auto regression models, 
it's it's just like that, but instead of assuming that the errors are independently distributed, you actually impose a structure. You say, okay, no, these are not independently distributed. There's a way that the, the errors are generally distributed, and it's given by this network, for example. Uh, and you can do that in a graph like fashion. And there's also lag regressions, uh, in which uh, meaning that you, you observe a sequence of, uh, for example, longitudinal data, and you say that individuals' behaviors today is a function of the, their exposure in the past to other things. So, for example, one paper that we just got accepted with a few colleagues from terminology, we also care about networks. Is we, we see the, the effect of the the, uh, the use of force. So meaning that uh, we we hypothesize that police officers who were exposed in the past to use of force events by their colleagues may be affected in the future. So they may be more or less likely to uh, repeat themselves. And we, we found some interesting stuff there, like a like a U-shaped effect. But the thing is that you can you can do that, that type of analysis. Uh, fixing the structure because in that case, police officers we can assume, for example, that they are not uh, the, the way that they are connected is it, it doesn't depend on them, so it, it's fixed. And finally, in the case of structure and behavior, uh, I guess so you, you care about both of them. We have in the non-parametric world, of course, we have agent-based models, right? In which you essentially you, you have a world of individuals who are connected and you can run simulations of complex systems. For that, there's a software that is very famous. Uh, it's I think it's called NetLogo. And I'm sure that more than one of you have heard of it. And, and yeah, but by the way, NetLogo, it's it's very nice because it, 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 it's really cool because they got it. it it's a um, it's a, I think it's a version or something related to the logo programming language. I don't know if you're, any one of you ever used it, but logo programming language, you have like a little turtle that you can like ask, give commands to move up and down. Yeah, and I'm just saying this because I remember they taught me how to program in logo when I, when I was in, in, in middle school. So yeah. yeah. But you also, besides just simulating networks, you can actually, uh, go beyond just simulations and do inferences in this case. And a way to do that is using uh, either approximate Bayesian computation, which is a widely spread method in which you, you can compute, um, do inference without actually having to compute likelihoods, or what I think it's more fancy, which is likelihood free MCMC, which is a version of approximate Bayesian computation, but it's uh, MCMC version and uh, it's, it has a better convergence rate. Um, and for those of you who are in, in epidemiology, you will see that actually agent uh, personal based computation is, is frequently used with agent based modeling. I think with uh, in evolutionary biology and um, ecology, they also use this sort of methods as well. In the parametric world, in the case of social network, we have what's called the stochastic, stochastic actor oriented models. I don't know if any of you have, has ever heard about it. But the idea of, of the stochastic actor oriented models or, or SAML, SAML or CNN models is that you have a, uh, a process in which it's a Markov, continuous Markov model in which individuals throughout time face the decision. Okay, should I, for example, start smoking given that I see my friend smoking? Or you can build the decision that you can face is okay, am I going to connect to this individual given that, I'm, that I smoke and I connect it this way? So uh, this, these models are used to study the coevolution of network and behavior and the way the way originated in the context of school uh, 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 the school kids and, and the behavior of the friendship networks and some health related behaviors and it's a really cool model by the way so if you're interested in that and there's also this is just to like uh, 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 talk a little bit about myself here i've been working on this uh, and Amon and mj maybe uh, may, might be aware of this but this is like, this is connected. So it, it, there's also, uh, I'm, I've been working on this model that allows you to actually do network modeling, but at the same time incorporate multiple outcomes, so binary outcomes in which, for example, instead of just looking at smoking, you can look at smoking, drinking, and other risk behaviors, but at the same time analyzing the coalition of the, of the graph. Uh, this, I, I call this uh, discrete exponential family models because they come from the discrete exponential family models. And, and now we, I, I will be talking about this at some point in the future if you guys are interested. Uh, okay, so that's with that. 
But there's way more things that I, I skip, and I'm sure that uh, Jonathan may have a, a ton of ideas of things that I, I forgot to mention that he might not know about. But here are a few that I can think about. And for example, if you're thinking about modeling evolution, uh, you can use what's called dynamic programming, which, I, which is just for trees. Uh, pretty much just about in biology and computer science. There's also, if, you're, if you care about clustering, identifying key entities in networks, you have all sorts of integrity measures. You wanna, you care about structural calls, um, network controls, uh, network pre collision and all the things that I'm, I, I, I don't know much about. I just know that they exist, but I don't know much about. But there's also, if, if you think about micro to macro behavior in cellular automatons, that's another field that's in mathematics, and it's uh, it's a very developed, uh, highly developed uh, uh, area, which is really cool. Uh, I'm sure that you you have you've ever heard about the Conway scheme of life in, in cellular automatons, in which you have uh, individuals living uh, in a torus in a grid, to, to bi-dimensional grid in which uh, people are alive or dead, and depending on how many neighbors you have, what are alive, alive or dead, you, you change their status. It's really cool. You can see some really cool uh, animations with that also. Then you have Bayesian networks, in which instead of actually looking at networks from the you know, rows. Saying if you have data on individuals, you actually think about networks from the columns. You say that the, the, the variables are interconnected to each other. And this is very commonly used, in, for example, in, G, in genetics, uh, when you're thinking about gene networks. So it's kind of like a, the transpose version of social network analysis. That's the way I like to see it. Uh, also called graphical models, for example. Then you have stochastic block models in which you can uh, simulate graphs and model graphs. Uh, in, in blocks, assuming that they have some uh, probability of connection within and then between. Uh, there's a lot of literature around it. Uh, then you have sign graphs, which is another field that is very interesting. For example, in sign graph, you find balance theory, in which you, uh, the typical uh, phrase that comes with it is whether you want to explore whether the friend of my friend is my friend, uh, and that kind of stuff, balance network. And then uh, there's also survey and sampling methods for network. You have this novel sampling, which is very, uh, fairly widely known. And finally, uh, the, by the way, this is a, this is a paper, the, the Alba and Barras, 2002. I think it's a paper that everybody should read. Uh, it's, it's an introduction to statistical mechanics of complex systems. It sounds, it may sound scary if you are not a physicist, I guess, or. Uh, but the thing is that they, they, it's, a, it's a very nice introduction to network modeling and clustering and random graphs. Uh, so if you're interested in all of this. Okay. And I think uh, that's for me right now. And again, so this is a very biased overview and I'm happy to hear more comments or if you have ideas of how to understand this. So that's it, thank you. Any question? A lot what? of terminologies. What? A lot of terminologies. A lot of terminologies. That's why that's why I give everyone the chance to you can again you can download my slides. I think uh, yeah, I put on the chat so you know where where to get it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of terminology out there. And I feel the same way when I when I came here, right? So I'm not a epidemiologist and and and, and, and MDs and epidemiologists they talk about with uh, weird terms that I, I barely understand. And <laughs> It's, it's, it's been a, a fun life, so. Yeah, any, any question, any comment? You know, I was just looking over like the, the methods, the taxon structure, parametric, non-parametric. I know it's recorded, but I did that thing where I was like, oh, that's cool, I'm gonna screenshot that. That's like, a, whenever I get like a compressed slide, I can't help myself but taking a little note, you know. Um, do you ever wonder, like, there's so many different ways of doing this, thing. like so many methods, there's just like a battery of possibilities. And like, what's, like sometimes if you have a task, you're, you know, you're developing a network and you're trying, you're trying to find the, the detection probability in some, of some link or whatever. And like, you try different models and you get like 73% and 75% and like 76%. Do, do you feel like the choice of methods here, Depending on like like for certain data sets, depending on the assumptions and stuff, the choice of method maybe is more or less important, 
right? Like I I I understand why you would use non-parametric or parametric statistics, but like, do do you think that network bootstrapping is going to be good for just about everything, and then some things are just a little maybe a little better or worse for some use cases, or do you think that there is a, a, a need to be strict about what methods to use for what? Because some fields, it's not like that. Like machine learning stuff, it's not like that. And even I would say for like some epidemiology, it doesn't matter if you use like a logistic or a regression or a linear model some of the time. You, you know what I mean? It, it depends. It's, it, might, it might matter if you have like a binary outcome or something, but typically not. Right, yeah, no, I, th I think you're right. So uh, as you said, it depends on the goal that you have. If it's about predicting, uh, then it might that it may not matter as much uh, because if, if you get to the almost, I don't know, plus one plus minus uh, accuracy, it, it might not like change the world, right? But then uh, again, it will depend on, on what, what's your goal. If it's about inference, yeah, it, it might matter, right? Because some if, again, if you have data that is specially correlated and you just throw in a linear regression, then that's that's not good because you will get the wrong inferences and you will you will come to the wrong uh, conclusion saying that, for example, the effect is present when it's not uh, because you because by construction, if you if you hand wave the fact that data is interconnected, then uh, it's kind of like a it's vacuous uh, the, the the effects that you might get so. So yeah, I think that, and that's why I'm trying to build this thing, right? So because, as you said, there's so many methods out there, so many ways in which you can analyze data, that it's important to be aware of what's like the, the most appropriate. And again, it, it all depends on, on what's your goal. So for example, in the case of ergoms, uh, the expansion random graph models are used for hypothesis testing of sociological and similar type of um, questions. But it's not for predicting graphs. So it's the ergons are very bad for predicting networks themselves, right? Because when we look at ergons, we are thinking about how many triangles, how many homophilic ties, how many mutual ties we observe. But we are not thinking about like the, this particular type, the likelihood of observing a particular time. And because of that, ergons are not good for predicting networks themselves, but rather they are good for analyzing, for example, if balance is a problem feature of a network. If um, if, for example, if a given node in the graph is more prevalent to receive type, uh, connections uh, or, or send connections, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I guess that it, it would all boils down to the type of questions that you're looking at. If you're thinking about this just as a pre-processing step, it might not depend, right? So it might it might not matter. Uh, but if you're doing inferences and you want to get to conclusion conclusions and do some. Uh, so um, uh, causal analysis, then yeah, you have you have to be aware about the limitations. At the very least, be aware about the limitations of the methods that you're using. Yeah, Jonathan, I don't know if you uh, how many how many methods did I missed. I'm not sure how many things that uh, uh, were you thinking about. No, I can't I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry, Jonathan, we can't hear you. Sorry, I tried to fix the other mic again. Okay, uh, you know, uh, there's there's a couple you didn't mention, but then there's a whole bunch that you also mentioned that I didn't know. So, you know, the I I think you know when I the it's interesting to and fun to talk about networks because it's such a general. Uh, it's it's a you know thinking about Barbasi and everything else. It's such a shift in considering multi-dimensional structures from the way, you know, I think from statistics, from the way statistics is normally talked about. And so, you know, um, Iman, to, to kind of address your question, you know, from my perspective, it, it's about the goal. It's about what you're trying to say and what you're trying to show. And each of these has, you know, each of the ones that I know it has to do with what I'm trying to emphasize and do. Since I do a lot of systems modeling, dynamical systems modeling, all my models are over time. And uh, everything that I'm doing is living in that world and where I can optimize and try and create explanations that help me towards my goal of, of, of what I want to say. That, that's my take. You know, everything has a place. Yeah. It's a place. Thanks. 
Yeah, I don't know. I, you good, know to, it, good to hear you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think that if this like a lot of what we do, or at least a lot of where we want to apply models is in a mixture of things, some perspective data, but also in a lot of the time in electronic health records, these longitudinal records where, you know, and I, I'm, I'm kind of working with a, a colleague on this idea that like the electronic health record is the form of the data is really important and the methods don't really exist that are explicitly designed for that form of data, which is um, sequential transitions between states. Like, I mean, yeah, of course it's a mark, you could say it's a Markov process, but it's not because it has this high degree of noise. And then it's also, uh, it's telegraph noise, like stochastic noise. It's a very weird noise form. And I don't think parametric or non-parametric methods account for like type of noise. I think like median filters do and like very weird stuff, you know? So like, yeah, it's starting with that realization of like what, what is the EHR, I think is an interesting, like it's, it's sequential classification, classification problems where you have state changes and different variables can imply the change of the state and there's just noise over time and space. And... Sure. You know, the, the, you know, the, this is an, the, like, you know, part of George's list is awesome because it's got everything from what I would couch as simulation world. Like, you know, we're talking about agent-based models and net logo where you're asking the, sure. what if questions, what if, it, what if the world works this way, right. To the data analytic, well, you know, what, what can I draw out as, if, if this is the network of, let, let's take your example, you know, if the question is, where do I intervene in this network to change the network, you know, suddenly issues of centrality and connectivity become hugely important, right? How's that spreading activation playing out? Whereas if the goal is more, you know, I heard a talk, you know, by somebody who had um, kids draw their networks in terms of how they worked through problems and they through merely seeing and visualizing it even without any of the quantifications that you know were, were that that have been played out here you know kids were able to, to to pull out new ideas of how to think about you know even even how they approach problems so you know it, it's about the goals you know the, your limitations of data. You know the the I I love parametrics, and and the reason I love parametrics is because there's an old adage that that it holds is that you know you're making assumptions, and you know when parametrics is really about assumptions, and if the assumptions are true, you're making things more powerful. The problem is, are your assumptions true, right? And so you're bringing up the issue of, well, is the noise falling in terms of a, a te technique I might use, right? Well, that, that's, that's the assumptions, right? If you can find one that makes assumptions that fits there, you're gonna get a lot more bang for your buck and distance there. Non-parametrics hold the idea of saying, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, I can't solve that. Let's, you know, I'm not comfortable with those assumptions, let's go ahead. Also utility, you know, it, the, I, I, it, so to me, there is a uh, case in point. Okay, somebody else mentioned mentioned diabetes. So I'll use this as, I'm working with uh, Cindy Berg. I've got some CGM data I've been playing with. And I did, and I extracted the dynamic, I, I, I estimated derivatives over time. So point estimates of all of these, and then built a model based off of a, a mixture model. So what we're doing is we're extracting out different patterns of dynamics, attraction, repulsion, cyclicity, throughout what's going out across the CGM data, the blood glucose data that's going out. And then rather than what I did then was I built a network of the how they move between the dynamics. So here are 23 different dynamics that they that p these people are existing in at different points in time. And what then the network is all about is can we build a network that can be used for by a doctor or a nurse or a practitioner to be able to say, you're here, this is a common path people go towards, which is really problematic, but here's a path that people use for recovery instead based on the network. Can we try and you know, use this as a way to understand how you move in that system? 
Now, anybody who's worked with CGM measures, you know that these are incredibly noisy. <laughs> these are, you know, there's a reason there's not, they're not closed loop systems or anything like that, but it's still creating, you know, you can then apply things like machine learning techniques to ask how good a job is it doing? Where is the flaws that it's, you know, in, in terms of who it's counting for or not? So, so I think, you know, ultimately it's, it's uh, you know, holding yourself responsible for what your, what it's going to be used for. You know, good science. It's awesome. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, now that you mentioned, I, I didn't even mention machine learning here, right? So you do have a, a ton of things that are going on in machine learning right now. Uh, for a start, neural networks, right? Of course. <laughs> a question. So how we decide? Do, do, do we still using uh, sample distribution in network analysis to decide what are we going to use in non-parametric or par parametric? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It depends on the, on the output, right? So for example, in the case of, uh, yeah, so in the case of ergons themselves, these are from the exponential family. So you're assuming that they come, so all, yeah, that's why I, I'm, 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 I'm with Jonathan here. So I'm kind of like in between. I, I love the parametric, but the parametric models work, they are, they are awesome, right? <laughs> So, 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 so I'm, I'm asking whether to choose on one or the other method. Are we going to look at the sample distribution, or, oh, yeah, yeah. or we looking, or we thinking of maybe out, or we thinking of the purpose of analysis? Yeah, no, 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 yeah. I think, two I, different things. I think if, 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 if so as a statistician, I always do a, a histogram of, yes. of the data. Yeah. So how does it look like? Okay? Yeah. Is it normal? Like everybody you like, is not normal. Yeah, you know, it's not normal. Yes, yeah, so if it is not normal, then I try, I try to, yeah, so I, I think that I usually try to go first parametrically. If, if I can make assumptions that are reasonable, I go that way. But I, I tend to go for, for non-parametric on other methods where there's nothing out there that can help me with the data, like to actually model it. Or, it, or, or it could be that it's way too complicated or we have doing too many assumptions. So for example, one thing that uh, you might kill me for this, but uh, I've seen that it's, it's very common in a psychology actually when, when you have this uh, these tags in which you have, I don't, I don't remember the name of the model, but in which you have like so many variables connected to each other, and like uh, you have so many assumptions on the distribution of the, the errors. And I don't know, when you, when you just put too much assumptions into the data, that uh, I'm, I'm not very comfortable with it. I'm not very comfortable with it. but. But again, but if I can go parametric, I will do so because as, as you said that if, if once it works, it, it's it's great, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, but for example, in the case of ergoms, uh, I my work I, I loved it because when, when I figured out that I can use uh, that I can calculate exact likelihoods of this for an exponential family, all of the theory available for the maximum likelihood and all that stuff is becomes available to you. So, and, and there's a lot of, of it out there. So you have so many tools. So, so yes, that, that's, that's the reason why, but yeah. To answer your question, I, I was kind of like going around. Yeah, so I, I look at the distribution of the data at the end, and if it looks on something like I can actually recognize and try to go that way. Otherwise, I, I tend to like build other methods. I've done that in the past, but I still I still follow, for example, try to do it parametrically. So yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a methodologist. So if I, if I see, Something that can be understood as a macro process, I will write it as a macro process, as a, or as a, I don't know, an exponent. Uh, uh, yeah, what not? So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So actually, we can try both ways. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you, you, you can do the same, so, and, and and I think it's it's very healthy uh, yeah. because it's always good to do a robustness check, right? So is is your method? Yeah. If if you get the same answer using two different oh, methods, oh, then. Okay. Then you're you're good. So we are talking about if we try both way and then actually the result is just very similar, then we go to parametric. Yeah, yeah, you, you can you can see that for example. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's because parametric has more strict assumption. Yeah. And we can ask that. Yeah, yeah, more than the strict is the strictness. So the thing is about more assumptions buys you uh, uh, more precision as uh, uh, so oh, right, 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 power, right? So yeah. the, the whole thing about non-parametric methods is that they are underpowered compared to parametric methods. Yeah. So if you have a parametric way of solving data, you just go that route because you are for sure by by construction you will have more power than a non-parametric method. I think Jonathan wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add in, you know, I, but you, you caught it, George, you know, the, the, it, it, what I was going to add in there, which is, you know, right now it's broken down by parametric and non-parametric, but you can really think about it as a continuum in many ways, right? Because it's how strict are the assumptions, how loose are there? Like bootstrapping really, it's near and parametric, but you can describe it as semi-parametric. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, there's, you know, all of these, there, there is, it, it's kind of how loose and how strict you're getting it. it and what happens, you know, like, I, I, I love to talk, you know, I love to talk about regression because it's kind of universally understood in terms of researchers, we all kind of have to learn it. And, you know, what, there are things about regressions, assumptions that it's completely robust to. And there are assumptions that you violate them a little and everything's going to go direly wrong. Right, so it, there is there's a there's a fundamental sensitivity to what's going on. You can't ignore dependency in regression ever, but you probably could ignore some heteroscedasticity, right? Some homo, you know, hom some fails of you know of homogeneity of variance, right? There is trade offs. There's always trade offs, it, and so it's good to have multiple of these in your pocket, but it is the case of where. Um, if you can make assumptions and they're reasonable, wow, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get more, you're going to be able to say more. That, that's what it comes down to. You're going to have, you know, the, if you, you know, think about it very simply of what parametric versus non-parametric literally means. Parametric means there is a population uh, series of population parameters, values, estimates that you, that you are estimating to. Non-parametric says, I don't know it, or, I mean, I can't know it, or it doesn't exist. Fundamentally, you're saying I'm not trying to seek that information. So there is there is even, you know, limited utility in those choices. No, you know, you want to have a swath. I don't know everything that George has talked about here by far. I do know a chunk. I know a couple he doesn't, didn't mention you. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I, I yeah, you have, I, I should say, I'm going to have uh, to, to include a semi-parametric method. <laughs> Because you also have that stuff, right? Uh, but yeah, no, and, and, and by all means, so you have to also consider. So there's a, a bunch of methods here, uh, but this doesn't mean that you have to know all, right? And, and the thing about, about it is that uh, in my case, I'm very interested in, in, the, in the methods themselves and the stats. But, but because of that, I, I usually collaborate with people who is not into that, but they ask my, my help. So the, the, the whole point here is that. Uh, the whole idea of the scientific collaboration is that you have people who know some stuff and others who know some other stuff, and you have to like put them together. And, and that's 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 why I'm here for it, at least. And that's how the way I think about it. I, I tend to work in very different problems, but that's because I I, I join people who is, who knows a lot about those other problems. And I try to help them out with whatever I can. Yeah, I have another question about this. Yeah. Go, yeah. you yeah. go. <laughs> okay. About the sparse data set, uh -huh. the data but like 30% of missing data. Okay. Sometimes hard to decide. Are we going to use any parametric or non parametric? If you are missing, you see? Yeah, like a, like a sparse data set. Like a, so many missing data. S P A. Oh, yeah, but, uh, it, but in, that, in that case, actually, parametric statistics gives you, uh, there are way, many methods that help you deal with that. So for example, in the case of paradigm so that's what I'm most familiar with. But the, the, you can't you can essentially integrate out missingness and like fit modes. Having missing data, you you recognize okay. I don't know what's this value, uh, uh, but I'm going to like fit this data conditionally on what I uh, do not. Oh, get the missing data, they get imputation. Thing. You also have imputation, for example, but yeah. in this case, what I'm describing is not imputation. You can you can do conditional estimation, for example. Oh, conditions of estimation. Things like that. You can say okay. Uh, in the case of networks, okay, um, I I have this data. I, there are a bunch of missing ties that are not that they exist or not. So what I do is that I fit this model conditionally on what can can what can can exist with whatever I observe. For example, if I observe five uh, ties, I know for sure that the data doesn't have oh. it's not empty. So I condition like given that I observe five, what's the maximum value? You, you okay. can do all sorts of stuff. So statistic is is fine. <laughs> you can you can fix it in many ways. Uh, but but yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think we have a, a Jonathan, what to say? Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to say before to the earlier thing of team science. Yay. You know, that's that's the way I like to think about things. Yeah, missing data is 
Missing DNA is universally problematic and universally, you know, it's, it's, it's irrespective of networks to talk about those issues. That's estimation stuff. It's everywhere. We should always be talking about it. It's huge. So the reason I, I brought it up because when I do uh, my own data analysis using EHR data set, this is so, it's, it's, not, it's very common to see so many sure. missing data because depending on whether this patient go to the hospital or not, if they do not come to the hospital for two years, they don't have any data for those two years. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, that fundamentally, so switching topic, switching, just talking about missing data, fundamentally what's key to missing data is why it's missing. Meaning is what the reason that it's missing, how does it relate to the questions you're asking? And so if you think about that from a network viewpoint, that gets more problematic because you're taking you're thinking multivariately. You're taking so many variables or so many different relationships into account at once. And so it's easy for these things to potentially be to cascade or, or be more problematic. So you're right. You got to be thinking about it. It's hugely important, but it, it's never, it's, it, it, it's, it's always important. It's never not important for a double negative there. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I have, it, it is a real trudge and, or, we should rightly lack confidence if all if we're all, if we're dealing with seventy percent missing, because our I mean, notice I'm flipping your number. You said thirty percent missing. If it's seventy percent missing, because then there is under underlying everything having to do with missing data is also a question of generalizability to whom. Mm -hmm. Or to what does your results, in this case, your, your network model, generalize to? And that is fundamentally just as relevant as whether or not you are somehow biasing the relationships through your estimation approach of what data you have. So both are occurring at once. It's messy. It's cool. It's messy. So you said, you know, I, I really like George's earlier point, and I and you kind of said this too, of you know, think about it, validate, you know, think about think about it more than one, you know, think you can you can look for convergence of more than one way and stuff. You know, I, I like all that. That to me is something I like to have some confidence uh, in what I'm saying. But I'm also a fan of thinking a priori, you know, things like pre-registration, which is now big in psychology and, and lots of other fields, is a good thing for us to be keeping in mind because it forces honesty about how uh, how a, how much of it is something that we laid out in advance versus might be building on the fly and therefore not as trustworthy. Yeah, and also reminds me, uh, and that's why in statistics we always say, fail to reject. Uh, yeah, we, never we don't say, say ask. We it. accept, right? But there's a reason why. <laughs> It's a reason. So it's like, okay, we say, okay, there's evidence that is pointing towards this, but like saying that it is, it, it's a, I don't know, unless you're in physics, maybe, and, and but I don't know. <laughs> but in social sciences and like other related, it, it's more difficult. You can always, you can just say that there's evidence here that things are pointing towards a direction, but uh, you can never be so caught and say, okay, no, this is like this. Uh, and I never like that. Yeah, so I think that we are top of the hour and uh, this has been fun. So thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully, I think we, we, we can make a, a monthly, as I, as I mentioned in the email, I think it's the second Friday, I don't remember, but, but it's there. So, and hopefully more, more of you can like join in person. If not, that's okay. I will, I will make a YouTube channel so I can publish these talks and these uh, discussions so we can have it at, uh, for productivity and hopefully if you have an idea of, or if you want to give a talk or if you want to if you have a paper that you want to discuss or if you have a research idea let me know it'll be great to have a discussion here i'm hoping that at some point i, I can i can have a layout a list of potential speakers uh hopefully maybe fly them in some of them or not uh but but we'll see so the possibilities are, are endless okay so thank you. Ron. Thank you so much for setting this up. I had a lot yeah. of fun. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be in person today. I'm, I'm at oh. home, but I have to run downtown to a conference in a couple minutes. Yeah, thank you for joining. Yeah, it'll be fun.
This is awesome. Okay. Stop share and stop recording. Okay, guys.